All right, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another Road Reflection. I am your host, Krish Mohan. Thank you guys uh, for tuning in. Welcome back. Uh, uh, if, uh, if you are unfamiliar, if you are someone new that is uh, arriving at these, at these videos uh, throughout the uh, quarantine situation that we are in, I'm going to be doing these daily videos. Uh, well, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, but they're but they're videos. I'll, I'll be putting up content on my um, on my pages, um, I, with YouTube, Facebook, whatever uh, your your poison is, and audio podcast versions of them as well. Um, so I'll be doing them. So there there will be some kind of content on these pages every single day. Uh, so welcome. Thank you for tuning in. Um, the one up, the one big, um, pre, pre show check-in. It's not really a pre-show. We're in the show, um, <laughs> for the check-in portion is, um, I think on Thursdays, I'm going to take a day off from doing these videos so that I can concentrate on, um, writing the dispatch for Taboo Table Talk, doing the recordings for that and a full day of just writing and just general whatever the fuck I need to take care of kind of day. Um, because producing content is a lot of work. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you guys know that or not. So doing the background research, doing the recording as you are seeing now, this is a pre-recorded um, pre -recorded situation. Um, and, uh, and then cutting up the segments, uploading all of it, updating everything from the YouTube and the Facebook and the audio and my website and all this stuff, um, is, is a, is a decent amount of, uh, work and time. Um, so, uh, you know, what, what I need to concentrate on too is the written aspects of the stuff. Like, cause I like to write, I'm, I'm. I naturally kind of have a, a writer's mind. Um, so, you know, even some of the stuff that I put down here is like kind of written and written, then I can kind of riff off of what I'm writing kind of. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to try to take Thursdays to not do these sort of daily road reflection -y type videos, but try to concentrate on fork full of noodles, taboo table talk in the dispatch, uh, just so I can, I can start pushing through on that content. Um, yeah, I think that's part of the reason, like, it's, it's, it's hard to get all of that stuff done in one day. I would like to write every single day. I would love to do that. But I think that, you know, th if I'm looking at it realistically, if I dedicate um, Thursdays and then maybe like Saturday nights um, or evenings or what have you, um, maybe Friday evenings, Friday, so th essentially just Thursday, Friday and Saturday, dedicate those times to, to, to make them more um, related to writing, I think that will probably, uh, help me sort of figure this out. I'm still kind of figuring out a, a good daily routine. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of difficult. Like I didn't really work out today. Uh, I might go for a walk at some point, uh, but it's kind of cloudy outside and, um, yeah, it's just been kind of difficult to get the, the workout, uh, motivation the last two days. Um, but other, I mean, other than that, I'm in pretty decent spirits. I got to work. I I did work on my album. Um, I am by no means an audio engineer, but I did get to uh, do a little bit of editing in terms of audio for my album. Um, I'm not exactly sure when I'm planning on releasing that yet. Um, I got the album cover design started up too. There's probably going to be some tweaks that I'll make to that over the next coming weeks. Um, and I do have a video, but the video is rather in the, it's, it's like in the middle of the, me working on the show. So a lot of the material is semi incomplete, not fully incomplete, semi incomplete, but there is some good clips and stuff that I can start putting out, um, as, as well. So keep, keep on the a lookout for, for that stuff. I, I do have a plan on how I would like to release it and all the stuff that I would like to do with that. But once again, um, I'm kind of, I'm kind of a one man machine in this situation. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a one man army, uh, trying to do a lot of stuff all at once. So, well, not all at once. I'm trying to compartmentalize the information. Um, uh, but there, but that is some good news in, in terms of that. I, I, I feel pretty solid about it. 
Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm doing okay. I'm doing, I hope you guys are doing okay. Um, I hope, I hope like these check-ins at the top of the show help. I don't know if they do or not, um, to, to kind of let you know what mental state I'm in, what physical state I'm in. Um, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that they help. I'm hoping that they help. Um, it helps me to just kind of talk about it. Uh, but I, but I hope it helps you to, to hear it. Uh, so, um, all right. So as, as I, as we continue on forward from yesterday's stories, right? Uh, this is sort of a continuation of yesterday's stories. And I think on Friday too, we're going to keep talking about these, this topic because it's sort of the hot button topic of the week, uh, or at least it's the hot button topic of the week for me. Like in my mind, this has kind of been been going, and and some of you guys might know that I've been um, I've been writing about the Black Panther Party. That's one of the pieces that's coming out. I've been talking about um, Dem Exit, uh, creating a third party. I've been thinking about that a lot and doing a lot of research in regards to that as well. So um, things like labor strikes, the labor movement, the workers movement, all of this stuff, kind of. Uh, is correlated with that so it's it's the intersection uh it's the intersectional topics of discussion um from from that from from those topics right so i've been thinking about the black panther party since like fucking december i've been working on this piece doing all this research um and then same thing with uh dem exit that's come up in the last month or so so i've been i've been looking into that a whole lot more looking into like income inequality and so the and and the worker the worker movement the ds what the dsa has to say and stuff like that so that has sort of been in the forefront of my mind so when once the news of 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 all these strikes started coming up it was it was like that's the the general direction my head was going to go so i'm going to be talking about these strikes the rest of the week um so uh be prepared folks be prepared Okay, so let's let's pick up from from yesterday. Uh, so, um, picking off from the videos from yesterday, uh, we do have an update on on the Amazon walkouts, the Instacart strikes. Um, not not a whole lot on the on the Whole Foods strikes yet, but uh, as of yesterday, the organizer of the Amazon walkout has has been fired by Amazon themselves. And if you look at it, yeah, this this totally one hundred percent makes sense as to how corporations operate um, when when somebody challenges their their power structure and their authority, um, and you know essentially wants to try to keep us under their thumb. So Chris Smalls, uh, he's my age; he's thirty one. You know, um, he was the organization of the walkout, and he got fired. And he got fired under the pretense uh, of a quarantine violation. They basically said he did not uh, quarantine himself when they said that he needed to be quarantined. Uh, so he, so they fired him. Is is sort of what they said. It, that's that's the claim that they're making now. Uh, Chris Smalls, he makes the claim um, that when they found out that there was a employee within the Amazon warehouses that was. Um, uh, why am I losing the word? That was diagnosed with uh with COVID nineteen, right? When they found out that this 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 Amazon employee was diagnosed with COVID nineteen, they told Chris to keep that shit under hush hush. That's 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 what Chris is saying. Chris was like, they they did not tell me to go and isolate this guy. They basically said we don't want to create any sort of a stir or a panic or any sort of thing. So just don't say anything about it. But who knows how much this person like went around like touching cardboard boxes, touching other people like like customers orders or interactions with other employees, you know, and, and now that's that's how that sort of spreads. Um, there there is this story out of Korea of um, an el uh, like an older woman, like mid I think she was like maybe mid 50s or something. I can't particularly remember the detail of that. But this woman in South Korea, she was called patient 31. Patient 31 was a very uh, extroverted individual that uh, caught COVID-19 and she basically went 
and she went to church and she went to a community gathering and then she went to a little party and then she went to uh you know a coffee shop or whatever and she and so she had interactions with a lot of people so her spread was was uh was very large um and and if and if the you know i don't know if this is the the right way to deal with it or not but right now we don't really have any plans other than to self quarantine and fuck ourselves over um is if that's the case, then you're not doing anything to prevent that as a company, right? Like we, we have a bunch of people that are like, stay away from each other, stay away from each other. We got to stay away from each other. And now you have a corporation that's like, stay put money though. Now this goes back and forth, right? Like people are going to go back and forth about this and they're going to say, well, you know, maybe this Chris guy is not telling the truth. You know, maybe he just, he's just looking to get more money out of the situation. But who are you more likely to believe? Are you more likely to believe a multi-billion dollar company that has uh, repeatedly chosen profit over people with its dark age corporate policies or a worker trying to help his fellow human workers? I kind of feel like I'm going to go with the worker on this one. <laughs> I kind of feel like Chris Walls has less of a reason to weave a web of lies um, and gaslight you than Amazon does. Amazon 100% will gaslight you. I mean, there's a reason why Jeff Bezos owns fucking the Washington Post. It's because so he controls the narrative. Like, he gets to control whatever story he wants to come out there. So even the negative ones are like, they're like to me, they're kind of brags. They're just like, yeah, I did that shit. What are you going to do about it? And I wrote about it in my own paper to tell all of you about what I did. So, mm, lick my bald head. Like, that's kind of the way that he <laughs> he operates under the Washington Post. Um, I'm more likely to believe Chris. Plain and simple. I have no reason not to. I have every reason not to trust what Amazon has to say what Jeff Bezos has to say, what some fucking PR rep has to say. I have every reason not to believe that. So, moving to the Instacart strikes, um, here's what the Instacart demands are. The Instacart demands are, uh, they want a minimum 10% tip requirement and a uh, $5 increase for every order. Uh, I explained this yesterday is they kind of have a minimum, uh, like do you get this much money minimum for this order? Like it, it's not a lot. Um, I should look that up. Maybe, maybe I can do that while I'm talking is, is, is the thing, um, like how they explain pay through the Instacart shopper app. Like I said, I, I used to do Instacart, so I can pull up the shopper app if I still have it. I still have it. Uh, but basically, you know, they, they have a, they have a minimum for, uh, for that. Let me see. Earnings. Ba, 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 ba. How earnings are calculated. Okay. Here's, here's what they say on the app itself. On the app itself, this is what they say, right? Uh, Instacart strives to pay the shopper, uh, shopper community fairly and competitively, for the time and effort it takes to shop, bag, and deliver groceries. Our earnings approach focuses on these points. Customer tips aren't included as part of what Instacart pays you for a batch. As of February 19th, Instacart guarantees a minimum payment of $5 for each delivery batch, uh, delivery only batch, and seven to $10 for each full service batch. Your total earnings on a batch includes the Instacart payment plus the customer tips. So usually like the customer tips are like a dollar or two. So out of that, you're making nine to 12 bucks per delivery. Uh, so it includes the batch payment and then possibly a peak boost. Uh, and then it also includes a delivery distance payment of 60 cents per mile. Uh, we calculate the most efficient route. So, okay, so essentially like you might get um, I don't know, maybe like a $15 order, maybe, right? Like if the minimum is really $7, like plus a $2 tip, that's nine bucks. And then on top of that, you might get, so, so not even 15 bucks, you might get, 
you might get maybe to 11, right? 11 or 12 bucks plus five, that's $16 an hour. Yeah, if it takes about an hour to do all the shopping and all that stuff, you, you got you got about sixteen dollars an hour. Um, that's semi decent. It should be double because hazard pay is usually double. Uh, so here's how Instacart responded to that as well, uh, because they did respond to it. They said that they will get the minimum tip. Uh, they'll provide sanitizer. They'll offer 14 days of pay to, uh, to the infected full-time and part-time employees. So you have to be infected for you to be able to get this pay, right? Um, and then they'll also implement sick pay and financial incentives. You know, apps like Instacart and DoorDash and uh, all these other, you know, apps, they always just gamify work. That's all they're doing, right? They have all these little apps and they try to gamify it. They're like, bonus round, bonus round. If you finish this order of 30 items in under 15 minutes, we'll give you an extra $3. Don't you want that $3, peasant? Go, go, go. Run around the grocery store. Find that. Uh, find those items. Clock is running. Can he do it? Can he do it? Let's find out. It's really all they're doing. It's that, that they're gamifying it, right? And Instacart, uh, their their big thing is, and and really like all of these, um, all of these gig economy apps and stuff. Uh, their big thing is is like, oh, it's flexibility. Like you have the flexibility of setting your own hours to come do this thing, right? And, and it's kind of like Sophie's Choice. So you have flexibility in when you get to work and how much you get to work for less pay. Like it doesn't even match up hourly to what you would be making if you had a part-time or full-time job at like a grocery store or at an office or whatever, right? Or you can get the stability of pay and then crush your soul. Like, you just get your soul pounded into the pavement every fucking day, right? So that's that's what it is. And this is a... Uh, let me see if I can pull this up. This is a statement from uh, Instacart. Uh, they said that the health and safety of our entire community, shoppers, customers, and employees is our first priority. Our goal is to offer a safe and flexible earnings opportunity to, to shoppers while proactively taking the appropriate precautionary measures to operate safely. We respect the right... Uh, rights of shoppers to provide us feedback and voice their concerns. Now, again, I want to point out that yesterday I did I did mention that um, I felt like uh, you know they uh, and this is this this has been said by several other people. Like there's an article that was written on Market Watch about this um, as well. Is when you get an when you get an order, you have to do calculations in your head. And and I basically like the way they kind of make it sound is oh that delivery includes you going to the store. Um, like the distance it takes you to go to the store and then the distance it takes you to make that delivery, but that's not what they do. It's just a di the, the distance between the grocery store and the customer's house and that's it. That's what they, that's what they will compensate you for. Even though driving to the store is also part of the job. Uh, so when you get a store that's nine miles away, you don't get that, you don't get the nine mile. Uh, you don't get points, you don't get 60 cents on on the dollar for every mile that you drive you don't get that for that nine miles right so i complained to them and they were basically just like okay then just don't fucking deliver we got other people that'll fucking do it and now it's like yeah maybe not maybe that's something that you guys should fight for too maybe i'm maybe maybe i'm i'm, I'm sore about that but they made a claim right they made the claim that uh, it, we respect the rights of shoppers to pro provide feedback and voice their concerns. Well, I did, and they basically told me to go fuck myself. So, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, they like, they like, didn't give a shit. They just like didn't give a shit. Now, this strike has caused Amazon stocks to drop by two percent. Hilarious. Uh, a couple other things that have happened too is the New York Department of Labor told Postmates, which is like another kind of like in delivery app, right? Um, to count their delivery people as employees, but there has been no comment from Postmates. Um, if they count the, them as employees and they changed the rules in some way that negatively affected their people, their employees, right? Because right now they're all independent contractors. That means that it would be a lot easier for them to get um, unemployment when they are laid off from these jobs when they are unable to do these jobs, right? Because right now for these gig economy workers, 
they have to go through hell to claim unemployment. Um, I remember going through that. So I drove for Lyft part time um, and it kind of supplemented some income when I was off the road. Uh, and, you know, I was not able to do that when Pennsylvania changed its rules about the date of your car. So my car was outside of that date and I wouldn't be able to, to drive for Lyft. And I, you know, tried to get unemployment and it took like over two months to go through all of that. Like I had to provide so much information for them um, and they had to get in touch with Lyft and it, it, like it was just a whole big mess just for me to get pittance, right? Just for me to get like pittance for three months to get by, to get to the next, next, you know, round so that I could have food on the table and be able to pay my fucking rent, um, you know, at a, at a really difficult juncture in my life. Now, firing the leader of the strikes, like I'm, I'm, it's good to see that Instacart is at least willing to, to negotiate at the table, like willing to be like, okay, we recognize some of your demands and here's how we are going to meet them. They still didn't meet the $5 increase, right? Uh, $5 minimum increase. Um, they, they still didn't meet that. They're like, well, we'll give you sanitizer. And oh, yeah, well, is that nice? That's, you know, so, but Amazon's not doing that. Amazon's not doing that. They, they're basically trying to use, um, financial dread as a means of stopping the strikes, right? They want that to be, they want that to, to destroy the morale of the strikers to say that you won't be able to afford food. You won't be able to pay your rent and we will make that happen. Like it's a threat is really what they're doing. They're threatening people that are a asking for basic human rights that are asking for, um, things that are very reasonable. They're not like asking, like I, I mentioned that yesterday. These are all reasonable requests to be made. These are all requests that have been reasonable for the last two decades when people have been asking for them, you know? So um, that's what this is. This is, this is. this is an exploitative act, uh, once again, to care more about their profits um, than about people, than about health, than about safety, than about the general, uh, general humanity, um, you know, the, about their customers. They don't care about their customers either. I wouldn't be surprised if, if, uh, if they, if they threatened the Whole Foods strikers next. I would not be surprised if the Whole Foods strikers, um, are threatened next. So I would, I would keep an eye out for that. So, uh, moving on to our second story, it's not particularly dealing with specifically strikers, but it does deal with uh, GM employees that are protesting over ventilators, right? They, they, they protested to convert their jet engine factories and their aviation facilities to make, pro to make ventilators, um, and they basically were in silent protest. They stood six feet apart and they just didn't do their work and they said this factory should be changed. And, and it makes sense because it's like, who's fucking flying right now? Like, who is on an airplane? You know, like there might have been some people that needed to be on an airplane in the very beginning of all of this. But I think at this point, it's safe to say that most flights are not like going anywhere. I think in the last couple of days, I've seen two airplanes in the air. So it's like the, no one's fucking flying. Right. And, and not only that, but like all the people that had to change their flights or try to cancel their flights over the last like four or five weeks, nobody got fucking refunded. So it's like there's all this fucking money just sitting there in escrow, I guess. But it's like they, they and, and they got all this bailout money, too. It's like they're fucking fine. So maybe you don't need jet engines being made right now. Like they're not looking to fucking make new airplanes. Let them keep the fucking airplanes that they have and then worry about it when like people are even even after all of this is over people aren't going to be super fucking pumped to fly the fuck so um this also comes in the middle of 2600 workers being laid off um, and temporary layoffs of 50% of the maintenance, maintenance staff. And GE said that it, it's not requesting funds from the stimulus. Ooh. 
oh boy, you guys aren't taking the money to help your employees? Boy, somebody should really give, fucking give you an award for all that shit. Wait, does that mean that it's you're not asking money for your CEOs and the people that own your corporations, but you're going to give the money and reallocate it to the employees that you fucking fired? Doubtful. So right now, there's seven football fields worth of space that GE owns, these GE factories. Seven football fields that are just be unused, that no one's using right now. And finally, so I get, uh, earlier this week, um, they, they did change some of their factories to start making ventilators under Trump's orders, right? And I got to say, what this story really shows is that the average working class Americans have more sense of resource allocation than out of touch rich CEOs. Like out of touch rich CEOs still wanted to make jet engines in their fucking factories when the entire country is like, we need ventilators and masks and all of these supplies because this is an upper respiratory disease. So obviously we would need ventilators, right? That would be like a thing that we need. So this brings up a really big question because it really seems like the workers are the ones that knew what they needed to make within these factories and knew like how to help out during this crisis. So why do we need CEOs and CFOs and COOs who are so out of touch that they don't know what the fuck is actually happening, right? They, they, they deem themselves to, to be these, these titans of industry when they don't even know what the industry really needs, right? They don't, they, don't, they don't really understand supply and demand, or it's that they do understand supply and demand when it comes to how much money they can make, how they can fuck over people. Like, they didn't need to fire all those people if they were just going to make ventilators. Like, then you could, and you could have used probably the fucking flight bailout money that you got. It really shows us that these community-driven efforts that, that uh, us on the ground level, on a community basis, uh, are far more effective than large profit-driven motives. I mean, if you ever needed to see a glaring example of that, boom, it's right there. It's right there. The workers are the ones that figured it out, that knew how to go about doing it. Now, Elon Musk did donate ventilators to New York City, and he reopened his Gigafactory um, to, to go ahead and make them, right? His Gigafactory in Buffalo was reopened so that he could, um, he could make uh, ventilators for New York City, which is the, uh, which, is the uh, which uh, a friend of mine called it the epicenter of the North American pandemic, um, so that's that's sort of I mean it's you know New York City is far more dense than a lot of other cities in in America so it makes sense that's where that's where it's going to be um, now in order for this to work in order in order for these factories to be reopened so that they can continue making the things that they need to make to help the American uh, uh, like help help America get through this pandemic th we have to make sure that they, they're being taken care of. So this is where this is where the importance of what these strikes are asking for comes into play and why it's so important, right? Because in order for this to work, uh, these workers have to be offered sick pay and hazard pay, paid time off, and they all need health care in order to do this because they are putting themselves uh, at risk during during a time where everybody's freaking out and telling people that they need to stay at home and there's no plan for herd immunity there's no plan for testing there's no plan to really know who's got it and how we can take care of each other on a, on a medical front anyway um, plus if these if these corporations are switching over uh, their manufacturing efforts to make these ventilators, it means that these these factories need to be cleaned and sanitized every single night. Every single night that they shut down, everything has to be cleaned and sanitized. This should be happening with every single place that is deemed as an essential place, right? Like, so grocery stores, uh, pharmacies, like all these places that people go to, like gas stations, gas stations should also be doing that because I think people are still driving 
um, not as much, but they're still driving. And um, that means that these places need, uh, need to be sanitized and need to be cleaned up. So if you're really trying to flatten that curve, um, then, then make the effort. Why, why is, why, like, make the effort. So, let's move on to the final topic of discussion uh, that, uh, that we have. So, the things that I've been seeing a whole lot with these strikes is that um, we're going to start seeing strikes from other, uh, other industries, I guess, would be the right word for it. We, yesterday, I talked about Pittsburgh, the sanitation strikes that happened here. Now, we're looking at Instacart. And Whole Foods, um, I'm sure other gig economy jobs will, will start coming in. Amazon, uh, that's a big one. Um, and, and really, that might be the central focal point with Amazon and Whole Foods, since they are owned by the same kind of evil megalomaniac. Um, we could be headed into a general strike if, 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 if they come together and say, hey, this guy is not, you know, even listening to us, we're not at the negotiating table and we're not at the negotiating table, right? Like average working class Americans are not at the negotiating table. We're just not, which is why we need these strikes to, uh, to show that we need to be at the fucking negotiating table. Um, and there might be a giant general strike that comes up because if Amazon is, is not going to provide the health and safety of their employees, they're not providing health and safety for their customers, um, then this is going to affect us in a much larger way uh, than, than, than we're prepared for, all to make Jeff Bezos far more fucking rich, all to make his PR department, you know, run some propaganda campaign to make themselves look better, you know. Uh, so I wanted to talk about one of the one of the general strikes that we saw since that's the that's kind of possibly the direction that we're headed to um like i mentioned yesterday i also talked about the healthcare strikes that might happen um you know like there there might be a healthcare strike too so this might lead us to a much larger general strike that might be happening so i wanted to talk about the 1919 seattle general strike uh so this was right after world war one the government had uh, promised the shipyard workers that they would get a, uh, a pay raise for their efforts to build ships during the war, that they were going to put a wage freeze during the war because they needed to put all their financial resources into winning World War I. Um, so there was a wage freeze uh, in winning that war, and, and they did, right? And, uh, and it came down to it, and the government went back on its promise. And the shipyard workers were not taken care of. And so they went and they talked to their management and they're like, look, we, we did the work. The war was won with our efforts. Um, you know, we helped, we helped in that effort. And I think we should be taken care of for it. <clears throat> and the management said no raise. They were like, there's no way, there's no way we're going to give you guys a rage, raise. And the shipyard workers went on strike. So... The union tried to negotiate with the management. The union tried to negotiate with the management. And um, <clears throat> the shipyard management refused to negotiate. All right. They were just like, no, we're not going to talk to you guys. Talk to the hand because the management don't want to hear it no more. Right. They basically did that. They turned it into a, a schoolyard game uh, because that's what it is, <laughs> you know. It's a, it's a game to them. That's, you know, people's lives are games to, the, to these people. To anybody that values money over, uh, profit over people, it's, I mean, this is all just a game. That's all it is. Um, you know, really, this, this brings up a question of ethics, right? Like, shouldn't, shouldn't you be able to take care of the people that are doing the work, doing a, a large amount of work for you? For the means of labor, that's what it is, right? So the shipyard unions basically went to all the other workers around the city and all the other union people and, and said, hey, these guys are screwing us. They are um, going back on their word. Um, 
we ask that you stand with us in solidarity and everybody said yes we will stand with you in solidarity and there was a general strike which was new in 1919 and it would kind of be new today as well um and there's a lot of history surrounding that and i'm going to talk about that on um on on our philosophy friday uh video but um people don't really pay attention to the history of all this so it's new to us as well right like this is not taught in schools and for a very good reason because if you teach this in school if you teach how to really organize if you teach how to ha use community efforts to help a whole bunch of people if you teach people what protesting and what striking and what activism can really do and really achieve and what it really means um, then they might actually do it then we might actually drive change we might actually see the the dynamics of power shift in a direction that is uh, more beneficial for all of us than just the few. Uh, and, and, and that's scary. So they use education as a point of, um, point of propaganda. So World War I and World War II is all about propping up American exceptionalism and not talking about how shipyard workers were fucked over by the government in order for a war effort, in, in talking about how Woodrow Wilson enacted an authoritarian act to make sure nobody talks shit on the military ever with the Espionage Act, where you're not even allowed to make fun of military fashion. Like, they could literally go uh, to war in camouflaged moo-moos, and you can't be like, are we serious that this is, are you sure this is how you want your fucking army to dress in a moo-moo? You know? Like, Nothing. I'm not shitting on Moo Moo's here. All right. I don't need. I don't need like pro Moo Moo people to come out and be like, "This guy's fucking intolerant to Moo Moo's. This piece of shit." Okay. I just think that they're impractical and illogical uh, as as an outfit for warfare. They're too loose and billowy. I I don't need to explain myself to the Moo Moo people. Okay. Now. Uh, in 1919, when, when this general strike was, was popping off, um, it was amidst the people's revolution in Europe, right? Like the Bolsheviks and stuff like that were, were going on. So the general strike, some people feared that this was uh, going to be a rebellion of the people. That's what they saw it as. They were like, oh shit, this is going to be a rebellion of the people. Uh, we can't fucking have that. That's crazy pants. Um, and so the media ran this propaganda campaign that, that the workers are being led down a very dangerous path by a bunch of radicals. Oh, no, the radicals are here, you guys. Oh, man, the radicals. Um, you know, and I think that's, I think really this is the first, uh, first time in history uh, that, uh, that we saw a bunch of skateboarders, you know, because they were, they were so radical. I'll let everybody absorb that joke for a minute. <laughs> now, um, they also called they also called the general strike un-American, which is bullshit, and which is a which is a straight up lie because it's kind of part of the First Amendment. The right to peacefully assemble, the right to protest, is part of the First Amendment. So how is it un-American when it's literally part of the first Bill of Rights that we have? That's the first, that's part of the first rights that we are granted. And you're saying that that's un-American. So it's lies, it's propaganda, it's gaslighting the American people into not really understanding what the, the implications of a, of, of a general strike really is. The implication of a general strike has, has really come from, in this case, um, the government letting down its people, the government going back on its word. If, the, if, if, a, if a governing body is really put into place to help as many people, to help as many citizens of its nation as possible, and then you basically turn your back on an entire group of them, a large majority of them, how can we say that this is an effective government? That's what the general strike was proving. That's what all strikes have proven is that the government is letting down a large portion of its populace um, and, uh, and these voices are going to be heard. And you're going to see exactly how important we are 
um, to validate the work that we do, to validate the labor that we do, so that maybe you'll consider treating us like people. Not an unreasonable request. <laughs> so all this propaganda starts going around, and, uh, and then you had Anna Louise Strong, who said this. Uh, she, she penned it in the, um, a socialist paper because all of these sort of mainstream papers were, um, were, were kind of like trashing the, the labor movement. They were trashing the general strike and they were, they were call, you know, calling them all these names and stuff, which, you know, it's like, a, you're going to call me a radical and that's like supposed to be a fucking bad word. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I am radical. That's, you know what? That's pretty fucking cool. So Anna Louise Strong pens this. She says, we are undertaking the tremendous move, the, the most tremendous move ever made by labor in this country, a move which would lead, which would lead us no one knows where. So basically calling out that this is something different. This is something new. And we have to kind of have a plan. We have to be organized. We have to think about what we're doing here because this, this does have larger implications to how we might live our lives. Um, and this hasn't been seen before. We haven't seen organization uh, on this scale before. Uh, so what she did is she created this drama of workers versus capitalists, which freaked people out even more, right? So now a bunch of these leaders don't know what the fuck to do. They're just like, what the fuck? This lady's, what? look at this lady. Can we say hysteria? Is that a thing we can still do? Can we just say that she's hysterical and, and friendly lobotomizer or something like that, like in public? Is that something that we can try? Is that, have we tried this before? Let's do something tremendous on our part, you know, on, on part of oppression. How have we not oppressed people before? Is public lobotomy something that we can try? <laughs> they just freak the fuck out. Now, here's the thing. A lot of the workers that were joining the general strike did not really know how to run a revolution. There was a handful of people that really knew how to organize, that really knew how to how to move this thing forward, right? Now, the mayor of Seattle, Oli Hansen, used fear to improve his public image by basically like um, radicalizing the strikers the same way that you saw Muslims getting radicalized by the Republicans after 9-11, right? Like they, you, you know, so, so you know, it, basically utilizing people's fear of, the words like socialism and Bolsheviks and all this other stuff, which, again, we still see all this shit today, right? Like, that consistently hasn't changed since the early 1900s, and even probably earlier than that. Um, and so he deputized and armed a bunch of students to make sure that nothing crazy would happen. And then the army showed up, and then there were machine guns set up all around Seattle to, like, to, to make sure that... So, like, so, so they're expecting these workers to get violent which there's no evidence that they're going to get violent it just like they're just like no we're just not going to come to fucking work dude like so and they're just like this is violence you guys standing up for your rights is violence so we're going to stand up for our rights by igniting violence to counter your violence that we think is violence for it's not violent Did, that makes sense somebody put that in the fucking newspaper So they finally got to the day of the general strike. Uh, 65,000 workers just didn't show up, and Seattle was totally silent, totally silent. And of course, there were rumors of that Ole Hansen had been assassinated, that buildings were getting blown up, and there was all this violence going around. Uh, but, you know, the, the stuff that I've read is not really telling me where these rumors popped up from, like who started these rumors, and really, if the rumors... Like, if people were just kind of at home not doing their work, like, they were just, like, not showing up to work or anything, um, the only people that were out in the streets were, like, the deputized students and the fucking army and the people that were operating these fucking machine guns. Like, so were they coming up with these stories and rumors? Like, that's who was coming up with them? <laughs> uh, so... Once, once this, these rumors started kind of spreading around, like people got uneasy. So the labor movement came around and they organized people uh, using like older folks and vets that kind of, you know, like they were, they were kind of respected members of the community and they organized them. And, and there was absolutely no violence from the workers, no violence at all. So this whole notion, like even going back to 1919, even going back to the earliest points of the, the, the 1900s, 
this notion that activists and protesters and organizers and strikers are all these violent people is just completely false. There's never been virtually no evidence of a protester or an activist or an organizer or striker getting violent first. It's always a retaliatory effort, right? Like, even, even in 1919, in the face of the army, deputized and armed students, and machine guns around their city, these guys did not get violent. That's very important to note because, that, because that, that is another proof that the media likes to propagandize this shit, that people in power like to propagandize this shit, that they gaslight you and they lie to you by repeating these, these bullshit uh, narratives that these guys are violent over and over again when they're not. Really, the people that are violent are the people in positions of power because they're scared. And why, th why they're scared is if this works, if this actually succeeds, then there will be a fundamental shift in the dynamics of power, in the way things are run, in the way that, that the means of production and the, and the way resources are allocated, the way wealth is allocated in this country. There's going to be a huge shift in that. And that means that they don't get all of it, you know, or most of it. And they kind of, you know, throw us a little bit of a bone here and there for us to fight over while they, you know, stuff their fat little faces. So what the organizers did uh, by with nonviolent terms is uh, they offered dine-ins, which are primarily run by women, um, community efforts to take care of the workers, right? They had milk distributors. They had people that would pitch in and collect garbage. They delivered oil to hospitals. Crime levels plummeted throughout the city if for the five days that this strike was going on, which, you know, go fucking figure that when, when you don't have a bunch of desperate people trying to get through and, you know, just survive by any means necessary, that crime goes down. So when you, sh when you actually take care of people, show them kindness, show them empathy, show them understanding that they don't want to commit a crime. Right? Like, if you show somebody some generosity, they return it back to you. Isn't that fascinating? Isn't that really interesting? So, uh, community organization starts going up. People start feeling better about it. Uh, and Oli Hansen threatened martial law. Uh, he started making arrests, and people started losing faith. Right? Strikers were starting to lose faith. Um, they were probably arresting some or uh some 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 uh strike leaders some uh organizers some major like organizers that really knew what they were doing um that kind of led the organization and i mean this is no different than amazon firing chris malls um this is no different than threatening financial instability of your family it's all about morale it's all about making sure that people lose faith in the strikers. People, you know, but, but there's no, there, they didn't break any rules. These guys are going by the First Amendment. These guys are, these guys are, are standing by their absolute right. And Ole Hansen acted like an authoritarian, made, made uh, arrests of people that was pushing back against an unfair, unjust, unfettered capitalistic system that was robbing them blind. And they were like, we're tired of it, and, and we're going to peacefully protest and set up these community efforts to take care of each other because it's very clear that you have no um, interest or means to take care of us. So we're going to do it on our own. Uh, Anna Louise Strong got arrested for sedition, and then at the end of it, because the, the morale in this uh, uh, during this general strike was, was kind, of, um, kind of sucked out, uh, with all these arrests and martial law and all this stuff, um, and, and and there were there were some issues with resources and things. Uh, Anna Louise Strong got arrested, and Oli Hansen became a hero for fighting Bolshevism in America. Like he became this fucking socialist hero, uh, or or this capitalist hero because he fought socialism or whatever. That's in Seattle. That's one city. Um, they could have made it if the rest of the country jumped on board. They could have made it if, you know, I don't know, Spokane would decided that, oh, we're going to send some people over. Oh, you guys are having food distribution problems? No worries. Don't even worry about it. We got your back. You know, maybe maybe Vancouver wanted to get involved and say, we will open up our, sh we, we will set up shipyard trades with you guys. 
you know, and really show the and that that would have struck even more fa fear in these uh, capitalist organizations. So then, you know, essentially then it, it, this this idea would spread around even further. Now, Winnipeg also had a strike in in 1919 where 30,000 workers uh, went on general strike. And this lasted not a couple of days. This lasted six weeks and it ended in in um, um, in riots. Uh, that were kind of instigated by positions of power and you know uh it, it was called the bloody saturday revolts um and two people died um i'll go into more detail of that in fr on friday's video um so so stay tuned um yeah but uh you know and and this is not the only other general strike that america saw too is is in 1934 similarly during the great depression you had a general strike in San Francisco that basically also uh, had a bunch of violent revolts, police brutality, because they were like, you can't fucking do this shit. OK, we're not going to tolerate people coming and, and challenging our authority of power. Just like a, a, a shitty parent that's like, oh, you are actually coming to on your own and figuring out how to do uh, do things on your own as my child. I'm going to beat the shit out of you. Like, it's just basically that. Right. It's like shitty parenting is what this government's really doing. Um, and that one had uh, better results than than the, the uh, general strike of 1919 did. Uh, there was there was some better results that again, I'll, I'm going to talk more about that and more about whether these strikes work and what they what they truly mean and, and sort of the pros and cons of that uh, on on the on the video on Friday uh, for for our philosophy Friday video. Um, and something else of like, is, is this things kind of worth fighting? That's sort of the things that I want uh, that I think I'm going to discuss, but here's the thing, uh, these, this, this idea was really kind of at the core of a lot of this stuff. Um, American exceptionalism and even, even stuff in Winnipeg and just kind of the roots of capitalism, why capitalism is so attractive to a lot of people uh, is because it's this idea that if you work full time, then you shouldn't be poor. If you work a full time job, if you work 40 hours a week, if you work, uh, you know, and, and earn a good living. And if you're a hard worker, there's meritocracy. Right. So if you're a hard worker and you do the job and you're good at it, then you shouldn't be living in poverty. That's why capitalism is so attractive is because that's the idea that's that's in it. But when you kind of let it run amok, it, the, the, the labor strikes are proving that it doesn't work, that there need to be some guidelines. There need to be some rules. There need to be some restrictions. You need to have some kind of ethical um, ethical restraints around this unfettered system that is all based on greed. You know, so and, and we, a lot of the issues that we see in 1919, a lot of the issues that we see uh, in in 1934, they all exist today, right? An enormous wealth gap. You, you have problems with immigration. You have problems with how are we integrating immigrants into our society. You have anti-socialist rhetorics, all this stuff. All of that stuff existed in the early 1900s and it exists now. And there were a bunch of acts that were put into place. Um, Taft put some, put some uh, anti-union acts in place. Uh, even Roosevelt put some anti-union acts in place. Um, that, you know, really, really made people not want to side with unions, that really, really made people forget the history of what the general strikes did um, and how the worker movement um, and the labor movements really helped us progress or, or fought on, on behalf of the people and, and brought us to the negotiating table when, uh, when oligarchs and, um, you know, people that were that were thirsty for power had no interest in in having us at that table uh so these these strikes are important there's a lot to learn from the general strikes um especially the ones in seattle the, in 1919 the first time that this country had ever seen anything that enormous before in one city alone um and you know th just the the fear that you saw uh the community that was put together and really, that's when that's when martial law was put into place, right? Is is when the community came together, and it showed 
it showed these people that were in positions of power that weren't going to negotiate, that weren't going to help us out, that weren't going to treat us uh, any better, that we can treat each other the way that we want to be treated with respect, with compassion and kindness and empathy and understanding. And we can run a functioning community, a functioning society without their made up bullshit. That's when they get scared. That's when Oli Hansen put up a martial law. That's when he got violent. That's when he arrested a bunch of people. That's always when it happens. When the community comes together and nonviolently shows people that we can create our own system that is better than the system that's in place. That's what these general strikes are going to do. And, that, and, and I'm hoping that, that you know we are headed in that direction because sometimes it really takes a kick in the ass for people to get it. All right, um, that is that is going to be the video for today, folks. Um, like I said, I think I'm going to take Thursdays off from making these daily videos and trying to concentrate on my podcast, trying to concentrate on my writing and trying to concentrate on like cleaning up um, and to just kind of self-care routines and stuff. Um, so basically, uh, then we'll go into Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, so it'll be three days of these sort of things where it's three different stories or his three different ideas um um three or four days of that sunday will be live saturday is storytelling saturday and friday is philosophy friday um so you know tune in if you're new please hit subscribe please hit that bell make sure you're getting alerts when i'm going live um i'm gonna have content pretty much every single day every single day that's what i'm gonna be doing trying to keep up on all this, trying to make sense of what's going on, trying to provide uh, as much levity as I possibly can. Um, I was talking to a friend of mine about um, about doing these live shows over Zoom. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do some promotional efforts in the next two or three days in terms of gauging interest of like, hey, I'm going to try to do this. Uh, there's going to be limited spots at first. I'm going to probably try to run a test um, and try to get some names of some people that I can invite to these Zoom meetings to run a test uh, of the Zoom meeting to, and do a short show, get some feedback on it, adjust what I need to adjust, and, um, and then try to do maybe a couple of them, you know? And I'm, I'm going to try to come up with the halfway decent format so that it's not, because uh, it's not going to be the, the same as coming to see me at a live stand-up comedy show, you know, where, you know, the way that I operate is I, I pick a, a thing that I want to talk about, which I do have, a, a, you know, a lot of it has to do with what we're discussing this week. Um, and, and some of the older forkfuls, like a lot of it's like anti-war, class movements, labor movement type stuff is kind of where my head's going right now. Um, so I have a lot of material in regards to that that I've, that I've banked up and will be working on. Um, so yeah, so I'm kind of trying to work on those as much as I can. So that is something that is, uh, that is going to be coming up. So, uh, if, if you're watching this part of the video, I know not everybody sticks around till the very end of the videos to hear me kind of ramble for the last minute or two, but if you are here and you are listening, um, and you are interested in these, um, live zoom videos, which will be like five bucks. And it, it'll be, you know, some kind of a, a stand up esque show that I'm putting, that I'm trying to formulate and kind of coming up with a format and an idea for. Uh, leave a comment. Tell me that you're interested. Tell me that you would be one of those people uh, that would, that would uh, uh, be, be a part of that, to be, to be uh, in, the, in the Zoom audience for that. Um, and, uh, yeah, until, until Friday, uh, stay tuned tomorrow. Taboo Table Talk will be out. Uh, and I'm going to be working on some forkful of noodles as well. So stay tuned, uh, donate if you can, not a necessity. Um, and I appreciate you guys watching and we'll, uh, we'll see you Friday guys. Bye.